Hey everyone, welcome back to Purple Noon, a podcast. And might I add, let's give a little clap. It's our 20th episode. Woo! Oh, yay! We made it this far. So, if you have heard us before, or if you haven't heard us before, I am Stephanie Conti, and I am here with the J to my silent Bob, Savannah Lenausay. Hello, everybody. How are you um, doing, Savannah? Good. We're, rec- we're recording a little earlier than usual. Come well, you might be a little, oh, shoot, you mentioned early and now I'm yawning. Um, but we oh, are doing sorry. a little switch up because I know last episode we said we're doing a streetcar named Desire. And I made a boo-boo because I thought I had the DVD and I didn't have the DVD. So we um, have to play switch up. Paying $4 for a streetcar named Desire rental in this economy? Get real. <laughs> like $1.99, $2.99 maybe, but $4.99? For a streetcar named Desire, when you could probably get that brilliant DVD at any flea market or any, you I know. I got the DVD for five, so I re- like it's. I still have it. It's just not in my house, so I, like I refuse. So <laughs> we'll be pushing that back, uh, but we'll definitely be doing that. But today we're going to be reviewing Chasing Amy. Chasing Amy. So instead of going deep into a story and blah blah blah, like how we usually do, I'm literally just going to jump right in and then give a little disclaimer. So what is Chasing Amy about? Chasing Amy is a film that came out in 1997, written and directed by the legendary Kevin Smith, and it's um, about Holden and Banky are comic book artists. Everything's going good for them until they meet Alyssa, also a comic book artist. Holden falls for her, but his hopes are crushed when he finds out she is a lesbian. Oof. Now, it stars uh, Ben Affleck, Jason Lee, and Joey Lauren Adams. So Ben Affleck is Holden, Jason Lee is Banky, and Alyssa Jones is played by none other than Joey Lauren Adams. And I say I want to do a little disclaimer, because if you've listened to episode one, or if you know me, been on my Instagram for a little bit, you know that I am have a personal connection with the writer and director Kevin Smith. Um, I've known him for a few years now and I did work with him on, I was a cast assistant for Jay and Silent Bob reboot. And despite that information, I want to make things clear. I saw this movie before I worked for him and the way I'm going to be talking about this film is going to be how I did before I had those experience. It's like, I would review this movie, but I wouldn't review like Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, the film I worked on, because that's a little unfair. (laughs) But this one, despite my connection relationship, and even more so, I have a deeper connection with this film other than knowing Kevin. Share your story, Steph. So as the plot says, Holden McNeil played by the legendary Ben Affleck. In my life, I was a Holden. And to be clear, it was one of the best aspects of my life being a Holden. Um, I was in a real, uh, I, I had met this guy where after he was in the military for a few years, he had come and he was always a loner type, always a loner type. After the military, he had come to this decision where he was going to be a loner the rest of his life. Like, He had never been in a relationship, never pursued anyone, or never wanted to really be with anyone. Yeah. And, of course, this handsome fellow walks through the door. (laughs) I fall flat on my face. I'm like, who's this man? Tom Cruise? Holy crap. I I fell in love with him the minute I saw him. And I hung out with him, and, you know, I had these expectations, But of course, after learning through him and learning about that, I knew I was like, oh, you know, it's okay. We could just be friends. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, Little did I know that every time we would hang out, I was helplessly falling and falling and falling more in love with him every day. And oh, I know. And there came a point where. In summary, I fell in love with every day. And let's be real, Savannah. Me and you are best friends. You have been the banky in this whole scenario. You were the banky, except you were completely different in a way where you were supportive. Yeah, I don't think I was like Stephanie. No, I, I, I was there right with you. We would, uh, one of the funniest parts, and I still 
talked about Stephanie. I'd still tell this Stephanie once in a while is we would all hang out as friends and then I would see like chemistry between them and I'd be like Stephanie can you come to the bathroom with me and we would go and we would just be like did you see that oh, and it was God. always in the bathroom of a buffalo wild wings yeah you know if that was going to be the setting of our version of chasing Amy it would just be set at a buffalo wild wings <laughs> good times good times. but yeah so Savannah was the banky, and I and I lived this before watching the movie. So you could imagine what a beautiful slap in the face it was when I saw this movie. Um, but so and and for people who might have not seen this movie and don't understand, like because the the meaning almost of this movie is very similar to the meaning of my relationship with this guy, and. Eventually, I never, I never wanted to force anything. I never wanted to give anything because at the end of the day, I respected him and I didn't want to set traps. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be the type of person that was like, he'll come around. And I never was because I just think that is incredibly unfair, even though it's like, to me, in my mind, it made no sense, especially because like we hung out all the time there was still a huge level of respect and I was never that person. And I have to, and I have to say that because I would hate if people think like, Oh, you were just hunting him or, you know, you were just Mm -hmm. trying to work on him and stuff like that. When no, I, I I just kept falling and falling for him every day as we hung out. And then after literally two days after I was in new Orleans filming with Kevin he comes and visits me while I'm in New Orleans because I have a two bedroom. And so we were, he was uh, in one bed, I was in the other. And one of those days, like he had never seen one of Kevin's films. And I go, you want to watch Chasing Amy? Not realizing how I was sitting there suffering because <laughs> I felt like I had put my naked self on a plate and served it to him. And right. I was just like, figure it out. Um, but there is a different ending. Compare And we'll talk about the Chasing Amy ending, but my ending is this. Like Chasing Amy, we had a car conversation. But for me, it was me going, I love you, but not just I love you and we should be something. It was, I love you and I'm tired of it. (laughs) So I just need to get this off my chest before I move on. And it was literally like my, not like goodbye forever. I'm never going to see you again. I can't handle your face. It was... My soul cannot take this. It has been two years. <laughs> yeah. And I need to just get this out there mm-hmm. and move on. And little did I know that when I was away in New Orleans, you know, he started thinking about me differently. You know, I he crossed the line where I went, you know, when he thought about me, it was like, you know, maybe she's not just a friend or maybe I don't want her to be a friend. Oh. And... You know, we had our little happily ever after. We're still dating. He's, you know, listening to this because he's the sound engineer for Purple Moon. So, yeah. So that is my relationship with Zach and my relationship with Chasing Amy. It's a very beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Now, one story done. Let's get to the real deal Chasing Amy. Amy. So Savannah, this was your first time watching Chasing Amy, right? Yeah, in full. I've always seen like bits and pieces, but I've never watched like the whole thing. Um, Now, I know know, like you've always been supportive, like especially like when I went to New Orleans and stuff like that. But and completely be honest, what is your opinion? Because this is another little fun fact. I personally asked Kevin what like when we first started this podcast, what movies we should talk about. Cause I was like, Hey, we're doing it mostly in criterions. And he used to co- collect criterions and I go, yo, what should we do? And he was like, I think you should review two of the most controversial movies in the criterion. I was expecting solo, maybe a Lars von Trier film. No, he sends me chasing Amy and Armageddon. Armageddon. That's something. Armageddon. Right. And so Armageddon's going to have to wait. A little bit, a little bit, just because I have some qualms with Michael Bay. I will give the <laughs> film a full, I will give the the film a full justice review, like, you know, talking about him and trying to be as unbiased as possible with that review. But yeah, today I've we're just going to be dedicating it to Chasing Amy. What did you say, Savannah? Well, I've seen Armageddon, so I have my opinion on that, but that's not okay. for today. But, so Savannah, what do you think about... 
Kevin. And what do you think about this film having its place in the Criterion? Do you think it's as controversial as people may seem? Do you think it's even more? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, especially for the time. And even even for 2020, this is a controversial film because – and I was really surprised when watching it because I didn't realize like how – crazy it is and uh, crazy in a good way in my opinion but it is about um a woman who is gay but she ends up leaving all like not leaving all that it's still part of our identity but she enters a relationship with a man and mm-hmm. i feel like that can be interpreted interpreted negatively especially yeah. you know in you know these times um so i do think it's controversial in that light because you're your people can interpret it as like a I feel bad saying this but sort of like oh like see it's better if you swing this way um yeah. but in reality it's not that at all I think the reason I like the film very much was I don't even think it had a lot to do with you know being gay per se I think it's more about the film was talking about human connection because in every relationship that's what we're all looking for you know regardless so I really like the film, but I I can see why people might be turned off by it. Very now, funny. what about its place in the Criterion? Like, do you think it belongs in the Criterion collection? Because there have been people who said, like, no, Kevin Smith in the Criterion <laughs> collection, get out of town. Hey, that's- so <laughs> what do you think of that? Do you think it has a place in there? You know, I do. Look, like, I, I know in the Criterions, we're used to seeing, like, masterpieces. We're used to seeing Three Colors, and we're used to seeing, you know, all, all these amazing films. And I think the Criterion Channel, I mean, collection with this film really opened up their variety because, yeah, maybe this film is, like, a little 90s rom-com, whatever, but I think it has a good meaning. And... I think that's enough to push it through the collection. I think the Criterion did a good job with Mm -hmm. that because I think they should sort of widen, you know, broaden their, their horizons with, and I think that's what Chasing Amy is. I think it was kind of their like, you know what? Like we see the value in this film, even though it's stupid, even though some parts of it are like crazy and weird. I think at the core of it is a really good story. So I, I completely agree. I think what, why this was picked in the criteria not only because i think it's a good movie with great and written dialogue i mean i've i've i just think the like the even the the sketchier bits of the dialogue you know the more daring bits of the dialogue Mm -hmm. are absolutely fantastic and they just flow seamlessly um but i do think this film is incredibly ahead of this this time like of its time like this film came out in 97 fun fact that was the year you were born I was. I wasn't born yet. I was born in 98. So that came one year before I was born. And a film like this might have not done super well back then. But it really could have been something major if it came out 20 years later in 2017. I think it came out at a time where sexuality as a topic was still incredibly taboo. And even though it's still kind of taboo today you can still go to different parts of the world and just find where it's taboo but it's definitely a lot more open Mm -hmm. today especially through pride through pride month you know all these things have given movies like this a platform to stand on and even um there's a documentary filmmaker named uh sav rogers and he did a ted talk on this film and how it impacted him growing up because he was a you know a gay kid in a small Western town and how it completely impacted him. And now he is actually making a documentary called the chasing Amy doc, where he's going to be talking, re talking to the cast and everyone who was in it about how this film kind of stands the test of time and even was ahead of its time. So I think because of that fact, even though this was added into the criterion, I want to say at least 15 years ago, I do believe it It rightfully has a place there because it is just very ahead. Kind of like a, a blue is the warmest color before the blue is the warmest color. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a big one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do want to talk about uh, just Kevin Smith um, himself. Okay. Um, 
I know you, you, you know, you guys are friends. So I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, tell you what I think of him personally. So a lot of people, when I do bring up Kevin Smith, because there's another movie I really like of his, it's, it's Tusk, but that's for another time. Um, and I do like Silent, uh, Silent Bob and Jay. And I think one of the reasons I, I do like the director, because people kind of see him as like, oh, whatever, he makes stupid movies. But Kevin Smith makes what he wants, and he makes it very well. Yeah, he, there's, I've hardly, I mean, there's one movie I can um, put to the side and say that maybe, because I know he had a hard time filming it, but literally everything else he's ever done, he puts his heart and soul into it. And we talk about that a lot in terms of podcasting films where a good, a, a bad film can still be okay if you can tell the director poured himself into it, if the actors poured themselves into it. Usually it's only actors who pour themselves, but if you can feel that there is a care within directing, within the angles and everything, then I think it turns a even like a, like a not so great film into an okay film. And that's where... I think Kevin does everything differently because, you know, he does the the comedies and everything like that, but he has his heart invested in it immensely. And I got to see that firsthand. But even without seeing that firsthand, you could tell that with films like Chasing Amy, with films like Clerks, and even Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, the first Jay and Silent Bob. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I will say, because by the way, if you ever want to have like, a really great movie night with some friends who don't know anything about Kevin Smith, just say, hey, it's my pick and we're watching Tusk because oh, ever since so. then, I am not allowed to pick movie night. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say Tusk is my personal favorite, but I do think this film, Chasing Amy, is by far his best, his most rounded film. And oh, I think God. it really displays not only his best um his best aspects as a writer but his best aspects as a director as well and you can kind of see in his in this movie we're going to talk about it in uh specifics there's a lot of kevin smith's personalities and i'm going to say all his films and chasing amy um the characters are from new jersey and they're comic book writers and uh, authors and all this stuff and it, it's kind of like he takes his world and puts it in the story, which I like. I like it when directors do that because it feels personal and it honestly adds a lot of personality to the film. So, and it I adds like relatability that. too. Like, yeah. especially when these characters are talking about like Batman comics, you know, things like that. It's you automatically, like, if you know about Batman Robin or even if you have feelings about comics or anything of those topics that he mentions, there's, there's this automatic connection that you can have with the character. You already share a common bond with the character. Yeah, and there's a part in the film where him and um, Holden and Alyssa are talking, and they're like, oh, you're from New Jersey, and they just start naming, like, the malls. Um, and I'm from New Jersey, so when they were, like, Menlo Mall, I was like, mm -hmm. I have been there. So, like, <laughs> it's fun, for, you know. Like I said, I think it's fun for the viewers, too, especially if you can relate to it in some way. Um, and I think a lot of his movies are like that. Um, Jay and Silent Bob, Clerks, very – very him. I will say the only one I don't know if his personality is it at all is Tusk. But I Tusk. really like Tusk. Yeah. Tusk is great. <laughs> I was out, but I was just like, ooh. Well, we'll get to that another time. But mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I totally agree. And I, you're so lucky that you can say, hey, I'm from New Jersey, represent, because you guys have Kevin Smith. You guys got Bruce Springsteen. I'm from Staten Island. What do I get? I get references about, like, Staten Island being, like, New York sewer. I get references, like, from the show What We Do in the Shadows, where, like, or even that. Pete Davidson. <laughs> That's what we have. <laughs> Pete Davidson. Okay, but, um, I'm just gonna say it. I'm from New Jersey. New Jersey's not that great. This is all we got. Whoa, you're gonna say that on a on the Chasing Amy podcast, no less. I, I love New Jersey, but I moved to Florida for a reason. A lot of people move out for reasons. So sorry. that's fair. Sorry. That's guys. fair. That's fair. But sorry. yeah, so let's discuss first characters. Yeah. So let's talk about our three main characters. So Savannah, what did you think about Ben Affleck's character, Holden? Wow. What 
what a difference in look. I'm just going to say that. Baby Affleck. Um, mm-hmm. Crazy. I think he's very relatable, especially for that time period. In the movie, especially in the beginning, he has very narrow views about a lot of things. Um, and he's just kind of like this typical guy. He's he's the comic book writer, I believe, right? He's the, he's the writer. Yep. And when he meets Alyssa, you kind of see that he still, as they form a friendship, as they grow, like, he's still kind of navigating through those feelings. He, you know, he says uh, gay slurs and he says all these things and Alyssa kind of points him in the way of just like, but why do you do that? Mm -hmm. Why, you know? And you kind of see this character grow and flourish. And even in the middle of the film, there's things he doesn't understand still, but you can see him trying and really like, I, I love Holden because he has this great friendship at first with Alyssa and he's content with that, but that grows to love. And I think that's so contrary to modern dating. Mm-hmm. A lot of us be kind of just like, okay, like he asked me out, like, let me just want to date with him, figure it out. Like a lot of us aren't even friends with the people we date. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, shouting myself out here, but um, I like this. I like Holden because he genuinely goes for that friendship with Alyssa, even when he finds out that she's gay, and that turns into this this love for her. So I I definitely love the growth of his character a lot. What did you think? I thought, like I said, being able to relate to Holden made him ever so realistic, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that can either relate to Alyssa or relate to Holden. And I like Holden because. He is, and I don't want to say typical, but I've met several guys like him. Like, characters in this film, I've met people like them. Mm-hmm. And and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I mean, like, they're realistic. And these characters, well, the only person I would say I, I you know, wouldn't have met would be someone like Hooper X. But <laughs> um, someone like Holden, it, it's just very realistic. And the sense of him just, like, being friends with someone and getting to know and falling in love in that scene where he's in the car just admitting to her it it didn't feel like you know like a cheesy nicholas spark moment it felt real it it didn't feel like Mm. and in in actuality it it really didn't feel like this movie was playing a script it felt like everything was based off of one giant true story especially the way that holden you know not only falls in love with Alyssa, but also the way where he comes to terms with, I guess you could say the biggest, um, the plot barrier or the biggest barrier in his life to be with Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I like his struggles and I like how for its time, he does represent that time where even though the love could have been involved because of that time frame, not everyone could have gotten past that roadblock and a movie like this I think is so great because even before if anyone else is in this you know gets into this situation or a very similar situation like this it's a great representation of that push like I think this movie was necessary because for people who end up being like a Holden in life this is a a push to see the rights and wrongs about being in their relationship. It's something you can learn from. Yeah. Um, So I I really did like Holden. Um, Not a fan of his beard, his facial hair, but I mean, it was the nineties. I forgive it. Um, But yeah, that's how I feel felt about Holden. Now let's talk about Banky. What did you feel about Banky? The, the foul mouthed friend that, is helpful, but in, like, the worst way. Yeah. So what did you think about him? I think, you know, he's extremely immature. He's very annoying. He's he's just kind of awful. But at the end of the day, you do see where the concern is coming from. And you do see that he genuinely cares for Holden. And I feel like that's kind of – in. it's important to grasp because in the beginning of the movie, I was just like, what is this guy's problem? Let him, like – Let him do what he wants, you know? Let him just go hang out with Alyssa. Yeah. But I did realize that, like, he's just genuinely concerned for his friend because he does see this – he does see him falling in love with a girl that claims she's gay. And I think for him, it's just kind of like, well, I kind of need to protect my friend. And he, unfortunately, is kind of the reason 
spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert here. Um, spoiler alert. 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 <laughs> this big blowout. Him and uh, Holden and Alyssa have this big blowout and things aren't the same anymore is comes from his friend, which sucks. But at the end of the day, I think that we could all kind of relate to Banksy being the friend that's just like, hey, like, I don't think this is a good idea. You're going to get hurt. He was overly aggressive. He could have been a lot more supportive and just been calm for some of the yeah. movie. But I do feel like at some point we're kind of just like, I, I do understand what he's saying, you know? I really enjoyed his character. Not only did I think he was funny um, and I thought he had great dialogue, um, but I liked his complexity in a way where – here he is, is someone who wants to be there for his friend, but at the time, the stigma of being nice and being helpful automatically or, you know, being caring labeled you as gay. And the fact that he kind of has to go around and help his friend, you know, from a heartbreak by going in this very weird, you know, not awful, but like kind of like, I don't even want to say half ass, but he's just kind of a jerk to him. Um, a jerk to Holden. Now, I don't think he's a bad character by any means. I just think he's plagued with the idea that, you know, in order to even show some type of caring without coming across gay, which is still, you know, a huge issue today in terms of masculinity, where even today guys are afraid to display emotions because they don't want to be called something that they're not, or it's just something that is used as a derogatory term. So I I liked the complexity behind him. And even in the end, even when he is faced with this, this question, and we're not going to get into it right now, he's faced with this question that literally could change the path of his life. And he answers yes, just for the sake of his friend, to help his friend along the way. And so I really do, I I enjoyed Banksy, Banky, I enjoyed the... His quick humor, I enjoyed a lot of his lines. And I really did, there's a scene in the film where him and Alyssa are talking about their, like, battle scars from sex. And I thought he was so funny in that scene where he's just talking about, like, different injuries that he's had um, Mm -hmm. through sex. And I, I, overall, I liked his, his character. He was a lovable in the end, for lack of a better word, douchebag. But I, I really did like his character and I like what he what his character's intentions were. Yeah. And I think the whole, when they were sharing their stories, I think it's the only time you really see him connect with Alyssa because after that, he's kind of just totally against it from the start. But yeah, I I think especially all the characters do kind of get affected in different ways at the end. Mm -hmm. And I definitely like Banksy's progress for sure. Um, all right, should we talk about Alyssa? Yeah, let's talk about Alyssa. Um, so Alyssa is the main love interest slash uh, lesbian film that this entire film surrounds. Um, I thought Alyssa was by far, even though I love Holden, I love Banksy, Alyssa was by far the, the most well-written character. By mm-hmm. far, mm-hmm. because even though Banksy, uh, Banky, I, I keep saying Banksy like that artist, Banky <laughs> and Holden, um, even though they were complex, the level of complexity and realism found within Alyssa is it's written incredibly well, especially the fact that because you know. There could be issues, the, like the one biggest complaint that people have today is that this story should have been told from the perspective of a woman. But I even think without that, although it could have helped, I don't think it needed it. Because I do, I truly thought Kevin's dialogue and the character that he created, Alyssa, he, he didn't need it from a female's pers- perspective because I didn't, yeah, I didn't I get any neutral. Yeah. Yeah, it was very, very neutral. Um, and I liked how even throughout, you know, even though this film mostly centers around Holden and his journey, you do see Alyssa's journey and how this is just not something where she can go flip the switch. Okay, yeah, I've come to turn with my feelings and I love you. Like, no, it takes time because for her, she has to look at everything she's done in her life and kind of rewrite the story. Yeah. You know, this isn't just like, oh, like, I'm just going to let, you know, the standard 
what my animalistic inhibitions are is to be with a man, just come through and, you know, we'll be happy. Like, no, she has to change everything about her. Cause it's not like she was a closeted gay woman. She, she was in pretty much her city, like a gay icon where she went to these bars. <laughs> she was notorious for having girlfriends and she didn't hide her sexuality. Yeah, definitely not. She was definitely proud. Mm-hmm. And for that time, I think that's also a special thing about the movie because, you know, 1997, I feel like it was sort of still – it was definitely more open. You had – I think that was the year, like, Alan went on TV and, you know, said – told everybody she was gay. I think it was, you know, the year where everyone was starting to come out. But at the same time, it was the 90s where, like, people were still kind of mm, about it. And I liked how – even though – to the other characters, being gay was this massive bombshell. To hold into Banky, to everyone else, being gay was this massive bombshell. But to her, it was just her lifestyle. It was just, that's just the, like, kind of like, that's just the way the wind blows. And I love that. And, you know, obviously that whole, um, even though we still have Pride Month and everything like that, that type of outlook is how I think all sexuality should be viewed. Um, that's just coming from a personal perspective, whether you're straight, gay, and everything else in between. I think, you know, obviously when people come out, it's a big thing, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like, it's a part of who you are, you know? And I think as time goes on, we're getting more and more like, what? You're gay? And it's just coming like, oh, cool. Congrats. I, I like how even then, you know, and even yet today, we haven't maintained that type of reaction. Even still today, like I remember when I was in high school a few years ago, someone's like, I'm gay. I was like, oh, shut up. But it, it's this film portrays it as like the way the wind blows. And I truly think that's just how sexuality in general should be portrayed as. That's just a personal opinion, though, of mine. What do you think? I think, look, I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, how do I word this? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. Take your time. <clears throat> I choked on air. Sorry. My big thing is always, even if, because there are people nowadays that are very uncomfortable with the topic of sexuality, with a lot of things. And I'm a big, you know, this is somebody's story person. I think if you are still uncomfortable with certain things like sexuality, watch these movies. Because at the end of the day, like like I said about, um, what was it, four months, three weeks, two days? Yeah, the abortion film necessarily agree with the topic even if you're uncomfortable this is somebody's life and this is somebody's story and I think we can all benefit from watching these things like looking at somebody's life from a different perspective and I I I I like it because I I think it all gives us empathy and I think it all helps us understand everybody a little bit more you know I completely agree and I definitely think this film can be listed on like if there was a list it would be next to four months and three uh three weeks and two days because it's educational in terms of even today you don't see films like Chasing Amy you don't see films like Chasing Amy That's today what I was saying it's it's very even now it's a very touchy film and even because I think the biggest thing is people have gotten over the like, you know, gay, gay has been accepted. But what I still see, because, you know, I have several bisexual friends, people still struggle to I, accept bisexuality or even just sexual fluidness. And so I think a film like this should be and I'm hoping that this Chasing Amy documentary really does bring light to this film, because I still see, you know, my friends go like, People like my friends who are bisexual are still told like you'll just pick a side one day, and it's like I think that that's just a smack in the face. Let's be honest, that really is just a smack in the face to say that about someone. It's like first of all, who are you to say that about anyone? Like you don't have a place to say that. But and I, I do think this film, like I keep saying, is just so ahead of its time, and it's even still nearly over twenty years later it's still incredibly relevant. Like I said, I really think movies like these, if you're uncomfortable with the topic, if, you know, sexuality is still not something you, you know, are comfortable with or just, you know, a lot. I know a lot of people that aren't necessarily comfortable with watching these type of movies. But like I said, I think at the end of the day, whether you agree or not, whether this is something you've accepted – 
this is somebody's story. And it's actually, we find out later in the film, Kevin Smith's story. And I think we can all relate to that in some way. I think we could all see this and be like, oh, you know what? Like, I've loved somebody that much. You know, it is, I don't think it necessarily has to even do with gay or straight. I think it just has to do with, if you look at it in raw, human connection. So regardless of what you believe in, watch people's stories, have empathy, try to gain some connection. I think it benefits us all, you know? Benefits society as a whole, you know? How can we ever succeed? How can we grow as, you know, not only as people, but as humans, as a a civilization, if we don't educate and learn and be more open-minded? I think everyone can still have their views, but every view that you or every opinion that you should have should come from a place of Love. I know every yeah. side. I, I've seen all the sides of the coin and I know which if I'm gonna stick with heads or if I'm gonna stick with tails. And sadly a lot of people don't have that exposure and people will have hate for something that they don't understand. Which is and so it is very sad. At the end of the day it's one thing to disagree, but it it's totally different to have hatred. Yeah. No, it, that's definitely – and again, I think this is where this film thrives for sure. This is where films like four months, three weeks, two days, they thrive because you might have already a side. You might be like, well, this is what I believe in. But like you said, there's there shouldn't be any room for hatred. Everything you should be saying is out of love for somebody and be like, you know what? I understand this person and their choices. So, you know, honestly – Round of applause for Kevin Smith for making a film like this. That's me doing a little golf clap. Um, And also, so let's talk about real quickly before we get into the plot and whether or not we like the way the story was told and everything. We need to talk about Hopper X. You cannot talk about chasing Amy without mentioning Hopper X because Hopper X is a character like I've never seen before anywhere anywhere let alone like this movie i've never seen like anyone done before this character a almost closeted gay man in order to sell his stories because him being a gay black man won't sell but him being this white hating comic book artist (laughs) this caricature of like the black power movement like an extremist version and he's still able to sell comics. And I think that's a crazy message showing that that type of extremism still sells and is still more viable than a black man being gay, mm. which is just like, whoa, that's crazy that this guy, you know, even though I'm sure that scenario is scripted, which also, by the way, I want to know how Kevin came up with the dialogue. If he had this, if this person was a real life friend that who helped him write the dialogue, because the dialogue that he has is just great, but it's crazy. And this whole character idea of him is crazy. But I I thought it was an, another way to make this film more well-rounded because inadvertently, not only did you see how sexuality uh, can be tough, especially during this time for a woman going through and, trying to figure out who she is, but also on the other coin, a a black man who is gay and how he has to cover his sexuality and he has to market himself in order to be a successful comic book man. Right. Yeah. I think what did you think? Definitely the funniest character out of all. Like his dialogue is hilarious. But I think it also shows the other side of things. Like, you know, Alyssa is this very free person. She doesn't care. She's out there. She's doing what she wants. And then there's Hopper X, where essentially has to hide himself because it'll affect literally his career. So I I think it kind of shows the two sides of the times. Yeah, and I like how not it's almost like Hopper X is a superhero in his own world because you know he's like you know Superman in a way where he's like you know um, except where the the disguise is him being like this super vigilante that you know supports uh, the Black Power movement, mm. and yet in reality he's just like you know I write what I need to write so that way I can become successful blah blah blah. But he sticks with this whole personality, and it's kind of like you know. Clark Kent and his glasses being put on. I liked how it, it like this whole 
Hooper X character, even the name of it, he just kind of felt like a superhero. And as someone who likes comics and enjoys reading comics, I, I enjoyed this edition of the character. Yeah, definitely agreed. He had he had a lot of personality and I liked it. That intro scene, though, in the beginning, the whole staging scene where um, um, Holden and Banky kind of just go along and he just starts he pulls out a gun and just starts screaming black rage like what a (laughs) jaw-dropping moment like when i first watched this i was like what i thought this was a movie about a man falling like what what is this intro like i i but i enjoyed it immensely that was great um so should we get to the sort of climax of the movie yeah, so why don't why don't you explain for those who haven't um or need a little refresher for those who haven't watched the movie and you need a little refresher. Why don't you what do you think is the ultimate climax of this film? Uh the hockey game. The hockey game. Cuz that's where everything kind of explodes. So throughout the film, so obviously, you know, Holden for a brief period of time gets the girl. Alyssa changes and you know, she reevaluates after having this beautiful conversation like I said in the car where Holden just pours out uh, the love for her and at first she's like you think I'm just gonna switch you think I'm just gonna change blah 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 but there's this moment of separation like seconds between them where as she's walking away she has this realization where it's like almost like I'm doing what I did as a gay woman I'm hiding my feelings I'm closeting myself from my my love and affection towards this guy, which she clearly had. She obviously, they had chemistry before, but I couldn't understand like how crazy it was to do that switch. And then to all of a sudden, you know, in a flip of a switch be with a man. But obviously it was much more than a flip of a switch in her head. This was a love that had developed over a period of time for him. And just like how she accepted her sexuality, she accepted Holden. Um, But the real climax that Savannah is talking about is when they're at the hockey game and Holden's facade of what he thinks, you know, being with Alyssa is like comes crashing when he finds out that he's not, you know, the exception that she's been with guys before and that she was experimental in high school and a little bit farther than the conventional at the time, for sure, the conventional experimental aspect of it. And they reach a climax where Holden can no longer comprehend or grasp the idea that he had of Alyssa. You know, he envisioned her as this pure, beautiful girl that was just a lesbian, blah, blah, blah. And it's like he could get over the lesbian part, but couldn't get over, you know, in his mind, what would have been viewed as like, and I say this loosely, but like almost like a traditional whore. Because he, she did sleep around with guys and stuff like that a lot in high school. And with his conservative views, that's how he viewed her after finding out. Here's the thing. I kind of see where Holden's coming from. Because I was telling Stephanie, I don't think Alyssa should have necessarily been like, I'm so sorry I did all those things. Like, if she was secure in her choices, I think that's okay. But the one thing I didn't agree with in the movie is that she didn't tell him anything. And she does lie because in the beginning she was, she just says like, you know, oh, guys were never my thing. It, like, pretty much implying that she's never been with a man before. Yeah. So I, you know, besides, I, I understand that Holden's perception of her kind of crashed down and I, that's on him. But at the same time, I think when you're having that, re- like a, an intimate relationship with somebody it's only fair to talk about your past on both sides. I think you owe each other that for sure. I Absolutely. Honesty. So that's kind of bad on her part. Yeah, I think she definitely should have been straightforward. I can see her before they had this connection, before they started dating. I could see why she wouldn't want to voice that out. Not only because she acts as if she's a little embarrassed about it, but also, like I said, with people today who get face, you know, the criticism of bisexuality, if she had said that to guys, to these two straight guys, it could have been into the topic of like, oh, you just got to find the right man. Oh, you, you just you, you didn't have they weren't good sex partners to be with. So I could understand in the beginning why she would hide that. But ultimately, with any relationship, you have to be upfront and forward. 
Yeah. So I, I do agree after they had started dating, she should have been vocal about that, especially with a guy who's emotionally sensitive like Holden. Yeah, and, you know, she kind of also knew that he had more traditional views, and that's not on her. I'm not saying that she needed to apologize for what she did if, if those were her choices. But as she was starting to get to know this man and as they were getting into a, you know, a romantic relationship, I do think it's only fair on both sides, too, that she was just like, look, like, I kind of said some stuff that wasn't true before I need to tell you because him finding out from Banky was also not cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I could understand why Banky told it to him like that because that was his way of going, see, I told you so. I didn't want you to get hurt. And now you've left me with no other choice. Obviously not the best friend a move can do. Like, not the best friend a move to do. Not the best move a friend can do. There yeah, we go. Proper didn't English. Have to be like that about it, but yeah. And then also the whole finger cuff story, I think was just hilariously written. And the idea of finger cuffs, like, Kevin, if you're li- listening to this, did, was that like a yearbook? Like, did, did someone actually have that in a yearbook? Because that's just so like. You know, it was so, a lot of things were so oddly specific. Yeah. So I'm sure it was a, a real story. But there was also a scene in the movie I wanted to talk about where um, Holden goes to meet Silent Bob and Jay. What did you think of that scene? It is by far the best scene in the film yeah because at that time i don't think people would have fully understood the movie without silent bob speaking and breaking it down for a way where the stereotypic man or stereotypic woman meaning you know a straight man or a straight woman would have un- interpreted and understood so i thought where he speaks and also i just love where like jay is just talking you know crap and he's just like get some like and he's just like getting up and, like getting angry in his face i just love those little moments where he's like fight me but i thought that entire scene was extremely necessary to fully convey the film and to establish that connection. That's where I think this whole educational thing, like from four months, three weeks and two days, like how we saw everything being done because we never knew the gravity of it. The same way we're here. Silent Bob tells the gravity of the situation for the normal straight man and straight woman to fully comprehend. Yeah. I think it also adds a lot of the film is personable now. After that, you know, that speech that Silent Bob makes, I think you realize, like, this is very real. This is somebody's, like, this isn't a story somebody made up in their head one day and was just like, let me write this down. Like, no, this was a real-life experience. And I appreciated the movie more because of that. Um, May I just say, Jay looks like a baby. Yeah. A child. It's funny, while, um, because I did read a fact about it, while, um... Silent Bob is giving his speech. He's actually eating sugar. Like he's just pouring like sugar onto a spoon and he's actually eating. Like that's real. That's all real. Which I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less from Jay. Um, (laughs) But yeah, like I I do think at the time this film was necessary, not only to show it through a a, a straight person's perspective, but to also show this character Holden, like you're not alone. And that is incredibly important important because at the day whether it's Holden situation or Silent Bob situation I think this the whole moral of the story is at the end of the day labels don't matter all you just need is a sense of a connection and a sense of safety and honesty within someone for order a relationship to flourish and so now with that being said especially about the safety of everything let's talk about the Menage a trois. How do I say that? I really the... wasn't expecting that. I was like, all right. I, mm. So <laughs> Holden, I, I assume this was his way to get on an even playing field or feel equal to Elizabeth. Yeah, the, the menage a trois proposal. That was the word I was looking for, the proposal. So he basically is just like, hey, he goes to bank, bank he and Alyssa. He's just like, let's all be together. And it was very, like, shocking because the movie, 
didn't seem like it was going that way. Even after you find out all about Alyssa and everything, it, it, I never expected that from Holden at all. So he kind of is trying to convince, especially Alyssa, might I add, that like, this will help us. This will be a good way. You know, like, oh yeah, it'll bring us closer together. Like no more fights. And Alyssa was just like, no. Yeah. Why would, it, why would we ever do this? Like, you don't want this. You just feel like this is going to like make us equal. And Stephanie, you made a really good point about that scene. Uh, we were talking about it the other day and you were saying that that is the moment where Alyssa lost security in Holden. Yeah, she lost the safety and because she had found someone, the one, the person she wanted to be with, the person she didn't want to share. And with that, it must have been for Alyssa's character to be so gut-wrenching because then Alyssa just realizes that her past did lessen the, the solidarity of their relationship because now Holden, a a man who who had traditional views of never sharing or anything like that, now all of a sudden wanted to share for his own ego and his own sense of security. And I think in that moment, Alyssa just knew, like, I've lost him. Rightfully so. You know, I think she made a good decision by getting out of there because, like you said, like, everything she thought it was, was it wasn't when her past was revealed. Yeah, and I can only imagine, I mean, as a girl, if a guy had told me, like, because I'm, I'm pretty traditional. I like when I'm with someone, I'm with that person because I want to spend the rest of my life with them. And because I, the idea of like a three way, I don't think it's wrong, but I don't think it's, it's not me. It's not me at all. I don't ever see myself having that because I too would feel like Alyssa where if I have found someone who I loved and wanted to be with the rest of my life, why would I want to share my connection that I have with them? to someone else. That connection is special to me. Why would I want to share that? Whether it be romantically or whether, whether it would be sexually, I wouldn't personally want to share that. So, and I think it also shows too, this whole scene shows that at the end of the day, there was no way of Holden getting over it. No, no. way whatsoever. It, and the it, fact that- the relationship for sure. And you might, and like people might think like, oh, well he was going to go the extra length, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, it's kind of a slap in the face to Alyssa because- he couldn't bring Alyssa down in his mind to his level. So he had to go to hers. And that's not fair. That is not fair in a relationship whatsoever. Not cool. and, but that's, that's also where I say, Banky, we realize how good of a friend he is. Because someone who did have, you know, maybe a, a slight homophobic personality. And I say slight because it sounded like he would use derogatory slurs as a way of comedy, not necessarily as a way of hate. He was willing to do this three-way with them for the sake of his best friend getting clarity. And we know that it's not because he's gay or he wants to do it because the minute, you know, Alyssa goes, I don't want to, he goes, Oh, thank God. And it just shows like as a friend, how far he was willing to go to, make his friend comfortable yeah I think at the end of the day even with his harsh demeanor and you know he 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 does say some sucky things throughout the film I I think he was trying to be the best friend he could you know absolutely from what he knew and without sadly in his mind crossing that stereotypic barrier of going from like the spine line between caring and gay, he pushed it without a doubt. And for what his values were and because he seemed pretty traditional as well for what his values were and everything like that, he pushed that barrier and showed this care- caring side um, for his friend, his best friend. So basically – they kind of all go their separate ways in the movie. Like, all of them. Yeah. Um, And the last scene is them all at what I assume is, like, a comic con sort of thing. Yeah, like another convention. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the last scene? Yeah. So the last scene is, um, like Savannah said, all three of them part their ways. Um, Banky is at his own table doing his own thing. Um, Holden is just kind of at this comic book event perusing around I wasn't too I can't remember if he had a table or not or if he was there or not I don't think so um and then 
essentially he makes a, a, a comic and gives it to Alyssa to sign. And of course she sees him and it's like, oh my God. And he makes a comic called Chasing Amy where it's his story with Alyssa. But it ends with Holden coming face of what he did and what he realized was wrong. Hmm. And it's his way of using, you know, the one way that they connected and then initially had collected was through comic books. So he had used their their connection and how they met to emphasize the the amount of how sorry he was to her. And after he realized and he kind of like, you know, and it was just it was done so well. Even the art, I really enjoy the art that they showed for it. Um but I thought it was a beautiful way because I don't think, you know, at the end of the day, he is who he is and she is who she is. And they're in that terms of a, you know, romantic relationship. It wasn't going to work no matter how hard they tried because they both, especially Holden, had these values instilled in him that you just can't let go overnight in yeah. a year, whatever it may be, that those kind of tend to be embedded in your core and who they are. And also Alyssa, she couldn't, I don't think she would have wanted to get risk being hurt again by him. Mm-hmm. So. I, yeah, I liked how the movie ended because nobody changed for anybody. And I think that's important. I don't think you can change anybody that quickly or even at all sometimes. So I I did like the how the movie like showed them going their separate ways and sort of Holden trying to right his wrong through this comic book. So I think it had not only a very much deserved ending but a very realistic ending. Absolutely. And so if you haven't watched Jane Silent Bob reboot, don't listen to this part, skip this part because there is a spoiler. Within Jane Silent Bob reboot, there is a chasing Amy ending. And I kind of just want to mention it because I think it works so incredibly well with the original Chasing Amy. Um, There's a scene where, of course, Holden is with Jay and Silent Bob. But Holden explains, you know, I had and always will love Alyssa. So we couldn't, but we couldn't have a relationship. But, and there's a scene in Chasing Amy where he was like, man, like I'm thinking, like when talking about Alyssa, he's like, I'm thinking kids, grandkids. There's literally a line when he's at the diner with Jay and Silent Bob. And 20 years later, it's revealed that Holden is like the the, the father to um, Alyssa and her partner's daughter. Oh, I forgot about that part. Yeah. Yeah. So that is how they end. And it's like, even though our connection couldn't solidify through a romantic relationship, there was love. And from that love, they had their daughter named Amy. And then Ben Affleck's character Holden gives this whole beautiful speech, which I think is also one of the best parts about the reboot on how, you know, after what had happened, he did some soul searching and pretty much the rest of his days were, you know, where he found the most solace in everything was chasing Amy, his daughter. And so I thought that was like, Mwah, ended beautifully. Like <laughs> there was, cause I don't think a, a full sequel Two Chasing Amy could ever be as sufficient as that 10 minute sequel. Cause I think if it had been like a full two hour sequel, it would have, it would have been tough. It would have been tough to get through, to write about. And I don't think it would have been done properly, but in this 10 minute little mini movie within one movie, I thought that was brilliant. And I just want to give a quick shout out to it because after I just normally when it t- comes to sequels and everything, you know, typically with sequels, you're like, eh, but this little 10 minute sequel within Jay and Silent Bob reboot was perfect for Chasing Amy and for the ending of Chasing Amy. All right. So what's the score? What's the rate? Ooh. Um, first of all, so I love this film. I have one qualm with it, and it's a personal thing. And you're going to be like, are you crazy? You know how I feel about shaky angles. I know what you're talking about. Because, and I understood the part in the rain. And I I do think this film is beautifully written. It's funny. It's well-paced. I do, however, I enjoy a good camera on a tripod. And we saw most of the movie like that. But there were just some scenes where I couldn't help my brain from going 
like I just said to myself, I was like, God damn it, Kevin, why didn't you put it on a tripod? Like, please, <laughs> because I'm just that type of person. So that that's the only thing for me that I would kind of knock it down a little bit. I still give it a 9.5. That's very high. Yeah, I, I, that's literally my only complaint about this film. I think it's funny. I think it's paced. I think it was extremely well written. And I think because of its significance, even to today, it's incredibly important. Um, it's just some shaky angles. You know, I'm finicky with that. So <laughs> sorry. I'm just, I like a tripod. I give it an eight. An eight? What yeah. do you think could have been more? Because we talked about a lot of good of the movie. Um, what do you, did you think this film had any downfalls? Did you, and don't be shy. You can say it. Um, do you think it had any downfalls or anything like that? Well, one of the most important things to me, and I think we've talked about this before, is like how many times can you rewatch this film? Because I think the my favorite thing about a movie, uh, like my favorite movie is Goodfellas because I could watch it once a week. Over and over again, yeah. The thing about this movie, I don't see myself personally watching it again. Not because it was bad, not because there was anything wrong with it. There's just no, nothing that is going to draw me back. Like, I know the story. I appreciated it. Had some great things. But it's not a movie I need to see anymore. So That's fair. That's fair. Like, like, you'll like talk that, about it like I will do now. But it's not something that you'll see yourself revisiting, you know, within the next five years. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I would never watch it again. But I value a movie a lot when I feel like I could watch it over and over again and, and not saying like over and over again in a day or a week, but like a few times a year, you know, and be like, yeah, like I, I want to watch it again. Just this movie didn't have it for me because I felt like I grasped everything and I got it and I'm good. So that's the probably the biggest reason why I'm giving it an eight. Okay. That, that's, that is entirely fair. And I, you know, I never actually thought about rating a film like that based off watchability. Normally when I, in terms of watch a movie, it's normally what my lasting impression is. I go based off my lasting impression from the first time I watched it. And so this 9.5 is from the first time I watched it. I mean, I might've given it a 10 the first time I watched it, but now 9.5 because this whole shaky angle thing has developed more recently. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, I didn't have any, what was I going to say? Like, I guess extreme things that I didn't like about the movie. It was just nitpicky. And when I find that, like, okay, like, what is bothering me about this movie? It's it's usually the watchability. That is fair. That is entirely fair. Well, you heard it from us. Um. So, yeah, this is Sunday's video. So what, 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 what are we going to talk about next time? Let me pull it up. I got the list. I know. I think Eighth Continent, because we did Eighth and a Half. So Eighth Continent. Continent. Twin Peaks. Ooh. If you haven't watched Twin Peaks, ready, get ready to binge watch it within the next few days, because we're going to be talking about season one, season two, and Fire Walk With Me. Don't worry. The last season, the, the latest season, will be talked about a different time. But I thought it would be best and you know, to have a podcast that's not over four hours long to talk about season one, season two, and Fire Walk With Me, the OG 90s, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm excited for that one. And, and then Gilda. Gilda. Oh, wow. What a different – we got Eighth Continent, Twin Peaks, and Gilda. Definitely a well-rounded week next week. Um, as always, thank you to our Patreon, James. James. And if you're like, hey, that's cool that they sh shout out Patreon dudes – every yeah. episode and if you want to know how to get it go on our patreon link is in the below link is in below oh my god i cannot <laughs> speak at 9 a.m the more 10 a.m in the morning um yeah and also if you didn't know i wrote a short story and if you don't want to contribute to the monthly of patreon i get it go read my short story why because all the money i make goes to purple noon so <laughs> that's what's popping and yeah tune in next time for when we talk about eighth continent we'll see you guys soon see bye ya.